You're listening to Autumn on the Air, the weekly podcast that brings you conversations about the impact of research commercialization and the people who make it happen. Join us for interviews with patent and licensing professionals, innovators, entrepreneurs, and tech transfer leaders on the issues and trends that matter most. Keep listening for an inside track on the people, IP policies, and politics changing our world. Industry university partnerships are crucial for fostering innovation, addressing societal challenges, and driving economic growth. By working together, universities and industries can leverage their unique strengths to create solutions that benefit society as a whole. Today, I'm excited to be joined by an amazing panel of guests, Gayatri, Shahila, and John, to discuss taking a holistic approach to these partnerships. Dr. Gayatri Shiniavasan is the Executive Director of MIT Corporate Relations, a position she has held since the beginning of February 2024. As Executive Director, Gayatri leads the growth of the ILP and Startup Exchange, building on a roster of over 200 member companies and forging impactful connections between global business leaders and MIT faculty. John D. Wilson is a director of academic contracting at GlaxoSmithKline. John's responsibilities include alignment of industrial and academic research to ensure that the science, technology, and people partner to benefit scientific development. John sits within a research externalization group that liaisons with all research units and therapeutic areas across his organization, as well as the globe. Shahila M. Christie began her career in academic research, focusing on small molecule drug discovery and development. Recognizing the potential for commercialization, Shahila transitioned to the entrepreneurial space by co-founding a spin-off company, leveraging her research. She has consulted for university-based startups and led clinical efforts for a medical diagnostics company in oncology diagnostics. In her current role at Portal Innovations, she supports the growth and development of early stage life science technologies. Welcome, Gayatri, Shahila, and John. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today. Hi. Thank you very much. Happy Thank to you. be here. Thanks, Lisa. Well, it's really great to have the three of you here, and we have a lot to talk about. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Today, we're talking about taking a holistic approach to university and industry partnerships. I thought to help us frame our discussion, I wanted to start off by asking what is meant by holistic industry university partnership? I can take that one, uh, Lisa. So holistic uh, approach is looking at the entire uh, institute or enterprise when you are thinking about a collaboration opportunity. And again, it may not start out holistically, but we have to always go with that mindset. And so from a university setting, holistic could mean what are the offerings that a university or an institute has to uh, leverage uh, for support in terms of collaboration uh, with industry partners, right? So I think about it in um, four uh, pillars, um, research, innovation, students, and education, right? A university has these things to offer. Now, each of these things can be different things to uh, industry partners. So, for example, research could mean uh, licensing of uh, technologies, could mean sponsored research, could mean uh, core facility agreements, fee-for-service agreement could mean, um, uh, did I say, uh, sponsored research. Um, so all those things are pieces that fall under uh, research. Innovation could be beyond what is offered in research, thinking about the startup ecosystem, you know, uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial activity within uh, a university setting. And then students, of course, are students. We have students in the form of um, graduate students, um, uh, undergraduate students and all kinds of uh, other trainees that can be leveraged for uh, partnering either through an internship program, experiential learning programs, and of course, recruitment. And then uh, lastly, education. That is one of the big pieces. Um, you know, it's bookending, right? Research and education, two book, uh, big pieces of an institute. And education meaning continuous learning, uh, like lifelong learning for, uh, you know, ex executives and employees in the companies um, that could be leveraged or specific um, 
um, areas of improvement or a specific project-based learning. So it could be anything, but a whole continuum of opportunities to engage. Yeah, that was very well put, Gayatri, and very informative. Uh, to me, speaking from the point of view of a VC firm, a holistic industry university partnership really represents a collaborative effort that extends just beyond the simple technology licensing by itself. It, uh, it really incorporates a multifaceted approach that is designed to nurture and really accelerate the successful commercialization of university developed technologies. So during the conversation today, I hope to get into uh, a little bit more into what I mean by the multifaceted approach. Yeah, the only thing I would add to those two excellent points and you know, the basis for what we look at is the fact you can't go into the agreements rigid. I think we all see sponsored research. We see licensing opportunities. Let's have a conversation. Uh, my goal within the company I work in and how I, I want to be the partner of choice. Uh, one of the things we do very well is we navigate the gray. So we, we look, oh, we can't do this. We can do that. It all comes down sometimes to budget, which Shahila would have a lot to, to understand and run to the VC. But I think when you go in and talk to a university and we have real conversations, this is your expertise. This is what we're really good at. It might not be a sponsored research. It might be an MTA. It might be very something similar. But let's get the conversation started. Let's start having, hey, listen, this worked really well. Can we get there? And maybe that will bloom into something great, but maybe it could just be a one-off. I, I would love to say everything turns into a strategic partnership and a giant agreement. It just doesn't happen sometimes. And I think the more that you approach things is, I want to be a good partner. I want to collaborate. And I want to develop science. I think that's critical. That's great. Thank you, the three of you. That's a great background to get us started today for this conversation. And, you know, Gayatri, I wanted to ask you, how do you think universities and industry can work together to identify some common goals, as well as align their objectives to have a successful partnership? Um, I think that is key for a good uh, collaboration to occur, right? To identify what are those common themes, common goals, right? So um, as John and Sheila put, right, holistic approach is all well and good, but uh, ultimately we need to understand where are the exact threads of interaction where we can start, right? So uh, to that end, you know, when we um, or when I go and engage with a um, industry partner, my first uh, interest is to understand what are they uh, wanting from this interaction, right? So that is at a baseline. Is it an MTA? And I'm talking about clinical trials, That then, then that's a disconnect. So understanding where our partners uh, are looking for opportunities is very important. And also going a little bit beyond that and understanding Currently, what are the challenges that they're facing, right? The specific, and again, it could be maybe talking to Shahila, but Shahila is representing the entire organization. So when I'm framing it beyond the specific opportunity for today, and I'm asking her about the challenges that her and the organization are facing, that is a little bit removed from her specific uh you know, uh, need at that moment. And so then I can uh, figure out, oh, these challenges can be answered by these specific opportunities within MIT. And can we re leverage those and make those connections happen? And same with John, as he was mentioning, maybe the conversation is about an MTA. But for me to understand, besides MTA, what are the uh, what is his boss, his boss's boss? What are they wanting as a vision um, for the enterprise for the next year or the next couple of years? That would give a good framework for us to be very goal oriented and not focused on just the nitty gritty of here and now. The only thing I would add to that, nice to haves don't happen as much anymore. You know, budgets are tighter, resource, FTE, uh, a yeah. lot of companies, a lot of organizations across, not just pharma or academics as well. We're more agile. We're doing the same amount of work with less people. So we understand that we truly need to partner and leverage what the university and what expertise they have, what we're good at, what they're good at. When you have that alignment, I find that to be the best partnerships. We're not sort of like, well, it'd be nice if you were good at this. No, what are you good at? What do you want to do? And how can we help? That conversation happens. I think you have a much better chance of getting a, a positive partnership moving forward. Absolutely. And and I wanted to ask the two of you, John and Gayatri, you know, uh, what are some of the ways um, universities and industries can work together to address some of the really significant societal challenges that we have and help contribute to the public good? 
I think one of the things I've seen in this scope is the community CBO style, community business operations or organizations that have really developed. They're working with the state. They work with federal. What is your company good at? What is the academic good at? And I think, unfortunately, we can't be reactive. We need to be proactive. There needs to be outreach early on, not just about, hey, listen, this happened, let's fix it, but ultimately start to have the conversations. I mean, a, a, an easy one to look at is homelessness, right? If you look at a homelessness organization and there's homelessness in the city, we need to fix that. Well, with, within the pharma sector, we might not have that, but another type of industry might look at, hey, listen, we have X X expertise here, the university have this, let's work with the city, the state government, and really start to build a foundation. So when we actually do have a problem, we can react a little quicker, but we've actually have a plan in place. And I think that type of focus, I know there's some institutions, innovation centers and institutes that are being built, and they're doing a lot in the communities, not just to develop STEM, not just to look at, you know, who the researchers are the future, but hey, listen, we're part of this community. We're a large institution. We're a large company. We have fingers out all across the, we need to be able to help across the way. And I think if we work together, you get an exponential response. And that, you know, also goes back to the question of money. I mean, money is getting tighter and tighter, but if we actually leverage our expertise and potentially look for a grant or something and say, Hey, the university is really good at this. This industry partner is really good at this. We have some federal support. Hey, look what we can do. I mean, you know, a project can be hugely more successful with a multiple parties trying to work together. And I think that people don't want to ask. We're siloed off. We don't think about what our capabilities are. And I think the more we do that, I mean, it's again, time. Uh, but I think that it's something that if you do have a significant issue and you partner with some of the larger institutions, as well as companies, I think you can make a real impact. And I completely, uh, I, what you said resonates with me a lot, John. And I also feel like uh, thinking about it Proactively, as you said, instead of reactively is so important, right? Public-private partnership is the way to go to make these things move forward. Uh, and of course, that is used in a loose, uh, like in a very um, vague manner and can mean different things to different people. But what I mean is, you know, we need to come together uh, to solve real problems. So it, be it um, homelessness, be it climate, be it healthcare, um, be it um, challenges with maybe AI, all these things are, uh, are e e with AI, not necessarily a societal problem currently, but the others definitely, but in the sense that can we come together, different industry partners, and, you know, um, even like, you know, private equity, venture capital through their innovation pieces and government, right? All of us need to come together as stakeholders um, to solve these problems because ultimately organizations are comprised of people, whether they are government organizations or for profit or, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, university, we're all people and we need these uh, problems solved. Right. And I think what you're, you're talking about is collaboration. And we saw a tremendous collaboration along those lines that I think the two of you are talking about during COVID. And now the, we get further and further away from the pandemic. And I think we're forgetting some of that about how well these public private partnerships and government all work together to to get these vaccines and these diagnostic tests out in, in record time. So um, I think sometimes uh, we forget some of the lessons that we very recently uh, learned so, Shahila, I wanted to ask you along those same lines, how can universities leverage their research capabilities to address industry-specific challenges and drive innovation? Uh, yeah. Um, industry, you know, including big pharma and VC firms, they're really well-versed in uh, knowing what the market needs are. More specifically, they really understand what the patient needs are and which areas require more therapeutics or diagnostics. So universities, I think, should really lean in and tap into this knowledge space to help support their research translation into commercial products. And there are several ways a university can work with a firm like ours, like Portal Innovations, to, to leverage their own capabilities and to drive their innovation forward. And some of these ways uh, include uh, working with Portal to really uh, work closely with their entrepreneurially minded faculty to inform and drive their technologies towards products that can really be commercialized and uh, address a specific market need. 
We can also help uh, provide mentorship and business support services to, to these uh, faculty and students. And uh, recently, uh, Portal has developed a proprietary AI tool in-house called Stargaze. Mm -hmm. And we use this tool to really map innovation within universities. And uh, universities can work with us to really identify uh, what the, who are those early career innovative scientists that haven't yet self-identified. And uh, this would help drive the innovation disclosures and find the startup ready science and help catalyze uh, the formation of uh, new startups. And, and uh, interestingly with this tool, we are also able to uh, help the, these universities find and hire talent and help also uh, finding teams for collaborations. So it, it's really a powerful tool and uh, we have different uh, support services that really work can work uh, with universities and tailor uh, spe these services specific to what the university needs are. So Shahila, just a quick follow-up question on that stargazer that you mentioned. Is that something that could help universities if they're trying to reach more underrepresented inventors like women and, and other groups? Definitely, for sure, yes. That's That's incredible. It sounds like a very, very powerful tool. So thank you for sharing that. And John, I wanted to ask a similar question to you as well. Um, it's well known that universities and pharma collaborate a lot, but talk to us some more about how they can collaborate to advance drug discovery and development, especially in this climate when, you know, there's a lot of issues on pricing, marching rights, and, and a variety of different things. I think we're at a real, uh, a real decision point when we're to pivot. And I think we need to look at way we we used to have a, a program within my company and it was Discover Partnership and Academic Collaboration. And we would partner truly in drug development. We would start from bench and go all the way through the programs to phase three, hopefully into marketing. We all understand that not everyone hits. <laughs> this can take seven to 10 years and a number are gonna fall off. However, I think, I really do believe that the, the old fashioned moniker of pharma kind of reach into coffers and steal RIP and big bad farm, we're not there. The expertise is in the academic centers. We're really good at developing drugs. Cutting edge science, cutting edge technology is coming out of academic centers. If you don't believe that, you're behind the eight ball. Uh, ultimately, that's where it's coming from. I mean, AIML that you mentioned, Lisa, is a perfect example. We hired 200 scientists over the last couple of years. None of them came for, <laughs> from other industry unless they list big, you know, big data and came down. So I think that the involvement and openness to be able to share in the development of drugs. Now, whether that share in, you know, the wins and successes, are we talking about royalties? No, I want to look with, you know, look in infectious disease, perfect example. You have an expert in infectious disease, we can develop infectious disease. Let's get involved with you at the bench and work to develop a drug. So if we get to the point where like, this is never gonna hit for development, it's not gonna pass muster with the FDA or in regards to POC, et cetera. If you can pivot with the same researcher and move through a drug development program. Now, potentially you would do this in a center that also had a medical school that could run a clinical trial. And what if in your phase one, you hit a point you're like, wow, we really have to change here. And you have the same researcher that you already have past experience with to build drug development that way and really look at, are we doing this the best? I mean, we all know the business development model. You know, you have a drug, you develop it by yourself, you put it up for sale, a VC such as Shahila might have it, and they might be able to license this technology. Well, that's great if it's a perfect fit, but what if you actually were able to involve yourself at the bench science development of that drug, mo molecule, technology, et cetera, and actually be able to provide real-time feedback? I think that that's something that has to change and we have to open that up. And I know the federal government, NSF right now, are looking at a lot of ways to help fund not only the development of drugs, but also of future scientists. And I think we'd really have to we do have to look at how we break down some of the barriers of this is mine, this is yours. Intellectual property, royalties, money is always going to be a concern. But I think we really do need to reevaluate how we're looking at it. There's some really brilliant people out there. And I think if you combine their abilities as well as with companies that are really good at X, whatever that would be, I think it's only going to benefit 
you know, the community as a whole. I mean, we always say we're always there for the patient, which is true, but we're always there for the business, the community, et cetera. And I think we need to look beyond just, you know, hey, we're here to develop this for why and you don't get to see inside. And I understand that. And I truly believe that because I think scientific development and expertise continues to foster within companies. But I think we do need, if we could figure out a way to de-risk preclinical development, I think we'd have some really good medicines that could come forward potentially faster, but also potentially cheaper. Uh, can I add to that? Uh, John, I I loved what you said, uh, you know, specifically about where university strength is, right? And I feel, um, you know, universities are in the discovery space, but at the same time, some universities are beginning to do the preclinical development and maybe a little just up to phase one, maybe, or just entering phase one. And I feel that is a great place for companies who are uh, specifically experts in those niche areas to collaborate and take it to the next stage because universities don't have that kind of um, research dollars because university dollars are all grant uh, based and more around discovery, whereas companies are poised to be able to do the development dollars, right? In the sense that pick it up from that space and get it to the next uh, value uh, inflection point. And, you know, if you do it in-house within a university setting, maybe the overhead uh, goes down a little bit. So that is one. And I also wanted to take it, uh, uh, you know, uh, pivot it slightly beyond uh, the health and drug uh, space and talk about how you know, startups in the university ecosystem is so important for this kind of development and discovery, right? Companies are coming to um, universities to understand where is the next innovation? Where is the next uh, disruption of my technology or my um, core competency? And I feel that is not being done at the research side of a university setting, but is being done by the spin-offs, the startups. Uh, either they have already become startups or are just going to become startups. Uh, so they are in that uh, precipice. And I feel these are all disruptors in terms of technologies, very futuristic because they are still very early, not really validated, but can be in all kinds of technology areas beyond health. And so I feel universities have that um, core to be able to leverage those. And these are not faculty only. They are faculty, students, alumni, all kinds of you know, uh, university connected startups that uh, you know companies can leverage. And an example is we have the startup exchange that does that whole ecosystem uh, and analysis to see what we have in different spaces. And the only thing I would add to that, Lisa and Gayatri's point is attrition is good. And sometimes a university might not want to hear that. If we kill something early and they can focus on a better idea because, you know, AIML space, you know, everyone thought when Bayesian mathematics and finite mathematics came out, it was really the algorithm pieces. And I think being, having, the ability, if you could talk to someone in the development space, whether that's tech, pharma, et cetera, to be able to say, this has no legs. Um, stop, pivot, and focus on something new. I think that it's an unfortunate news to get, but sometimes it really helps. I mean, if we can kill it early and move on, you can get to a better piece of technology or science. Absolutely. I've, I'm have i a patent attorney. I've worked in the pharma space my entire career, and I've seen where you, know, you get to phase three and something ends up getting killed there after billions of dollars. So I completely agree with you, John. If you can kill it early and move on, there's so much that can be learned from, you know, killing a project that can result in something a lot more successful later on. So those are some really, really great points. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about communication because that's really just such an important part of so many different aspects of our lives. And not surprisingly, it's also key in uh, industry university partnerships as well. So, I'm curious for any one of the three of you, based on all the experience that you have, what are some of the best practices for creating and maintaining effective communication during these partnerships? Because it really is crucial. To your point, John, communicating maybe early on that, hey, look, this doesn't have any legs. We need to kill it. But, you know, I think sometimes that is a challenge for, for universities and industry in these types of partnerships. Yeah, I can go quickly uh, just to showcase what has worked for us at Portal with our partners. So uh, uh, appointing a point person on both sides uh, starts off, you start off with that and setting clear expectations. And this can evolve as the partnership evolves. Those expectations may change, but then but having a clear set of 
expectations at the start is really very important. And it's important for the communication between these two people to be clear and transparent based on mutual respect and trust. Um, it's also important for them to kind of set up a regular cadence for meetings and they can decide what the frequency could be. It could be bi-monthly or it can be quarterly, whatever best meets uh, their needs. So this has kind of worked well for us here at Portal. I just wanted to add to Shahila's thing at MIT, we have the industry liaison program. And I think, um, you know, John, uh, you are familiar with that. But um, in essence, that is a way to uh, articulate what Shahila is saying. You have one point person dedicated to work on those um, collaborations and that opportunity to move forward. And so I think um, having um, that point person our champion within the two between the two organization is key uh, to move those uh, collaborations forward and also having one person who's uh, doing the uh, daily dives or weekly dives to understand where things are getting stuck uh, where to unstuck things or explain things is also key in addition to having the champions and the only thing I would add to both Shahila and Gayatri's point is get on the phone, put the email down. Yeah. I know yes. it's easy. I know it's easy to shoot and text. But if you have to deliver good news, it's good to actually talk to a human being. If you have to deliver bad news, there's no interpretation of an email. And I think generally, unfortunately, you start forest fires by an email that someone's like, well, what's his tone mean on that? Because I put an extra comma in, you know, that's more of an IP term, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so and or falls into place. But I think that the really the human connection of the fact like, you know, stuff goes bad. It happens. Get on the phone, talk about it. Let's fix it. Don't let it continue. Don't send an email that could exacerbate the issue. But I think if, you know, to Shahila's point, you have very clear ideas, you're very direct. Uh, it's very clear what we want. Things are going to happen. It's science. I'm sorry. It doesn't always go the way you want it to go. But get on the phone, spend some time talking to somebody. It doesn't all have to be business. How's your family? People have bad days or you know, it's just like, how was the weekend? Just make it humanized again. I mean, get away from the emails. I know they're quick. I know they're easy, but I have found to have better success when things are off or when things are good the next time I see them. I mean, think about the meetings we go to between you know meeting and having interactions with people. It sort of breaks down that piece and it makes everything, I think, just flow a little easier. And I don't know about the three of you, but what I'm finding is that I'm, I spend a lot more time emailing. And if I just schedule a meeting and have a call with someone, I can resolve something a lot faster by having that telephone call than I can, you know, maybe spending an hour of back and forth on email. So to your point, John, I, I think it's a, a really great one. A question for the any one of the three of you who, who are interested in answering this one. How do you think universities and industries can collaborate to enhance workforce development and provide opportunities for what Gayatri was talking about earlier about continuous learning and skill development? So one of the biggest things we're pushing right now um, is we're trying to drive a studentship program that's very similar to what we have in the UK through the case studentships, the BBSRC, EPSRC, is we're looking at a way to leverage federal money, university input, and matching dollars from industry to try to develop the future scientists. It's not an easy task. I mean, it's sort of like turning the Titanic, but we have a real drive. I mean, our, our company has something like 227 studentships in the UK. We have 27 in the US. So obviously there's a drastic difference. And when I try to push the buttons on why, it's not because we don't want to, it's because of budget of what we can actually anticipate what we can do. We do not need to be collated with these universities. We do have some postdocs, some fellows, some PhD studentships. We need to have a high focus, but budget gets tighter. So when you look at a company that is capital-based, we have investors to make happy. We have to make sure the bottom line is there. The things that start to fall off the edges, unfortunately, are sometimes the development of future scientists. And we have some really good technology that they might not have that they can come to expose. And when you see a student come and you get an email from them or you get a phone call to say, hey, listen, I had a great time and you know, this is what happened. If they come to work here, perfect, excellent. But that's not the goal. The goal is to expand the science and develop. It's more pre-competitive. So we don't do a lot of stuff on marketed assets, but we're looking at developmental science. I think we do need to drive that better. And I find one of the biggest roadblocks right now 
is the financial contribution. Uh, we do have some fellowship programs that are extraordinarily successful, but they're matching. University puts a piece in, we put a piece in. So when you look at the bottom line, it's a $50,000 contribution for this. We're getting a $100,000 you know, project overarching that both helps the university, but also helps our company um, and the scientists because they get exposed to technology and maybe a project or a scope that's cutting edge. It might not be you know, clinical or marketable IP, but at the same time, it's something that's in the community that's growing. And I think we do need to do a better job with that. And I'm hoping some of the initiatives, for example, the NSF is putting out to really leverage, you know, fi federal funding dollars to do this. I hope it will get there. And I know the UK has been doing this for a lot of years. It's very well established. And I'm hoping we'll be, we're basically at the start of building something similar in the United States. Now, John and Gaitri, I wanted to ask you, how do you think industry university partnerships can be scaled and replicated to maximize their impact and benefit for society? Um, so the way I think about it, impact for society is, you know, I think we kind of alluded to it in our, in our previous um, uh, question. Um, but the way I think about it is to look at what are the societal problems? And again, look look at which are the companies uh, industry partners that are suited to be able to solve those problems. If there is no match, it's not going to work, right? So that's where I think, like uh, like John alluded to it, if it is like a um, technology challenge, you can't go to a company that is uh, technology as in, you know, hardware uh, or something like that, that kind of uh, challenge, maybe AI focused or things like that, but very hardware or technology focused. You can't go to a company that is a biotech company to ask for a fit. And that's like a mismatch. And so, uh, but again, looking at climate, for example, I think every company has um uh, that is a challenge for each company and every company wants to solve it in their own um, way to address their um, their challenges, right? So um, looking at from a fit angle is the best way to make all these societal uh, challenges solved. I mean, solved is a, a very strong word, I think, or approach to a solution. But at the same time, uh, it can't be... Um, just thinking about a challenge and then reaching out to uh, cold to like 100 companies and saying, are you interested in uh, collaborating? So I, I don't know. I'm saying the same thing, but uh, giving it in, <laughs> uh, in different words. No, and I would agree with Gayatri, and I completely understand what you're saying. I mean, a perfect example for our company is drugs in the developing world. So malaria, TB, et cetera. We have a very large program. We do a lot of research. A lot of that research and tech sits within our company. But if you call us and ask for it, guess what? We're sending it out. It's we're trying to develop a program. I mean, how could you say, I have a really good idea to help malaria and we want to try to develop new medicines? Oh, sorry, you're gonna to have to pay for it. So we do a lot of work to try to, you know, let those materials be available for free and let the science just develop. I mean, if you're gonna come up with a TB vaccine or a malaria vaccine and you wanna do the work, we need to work together to do that. There obviously is risk, there's obviously intellectual property concern. Again, we have a board member we have to make happy. But at the same time, if you can get rid of something, when I say something for us, it would be a drug or a platform, et cetera, and you can make it open source like we do for a lot of the AI technology, do it. I mean, I, we don't. I don't make the final decision for my company. We all have bosses. I think it's gotten a lot better. I see a lot more opportunities that I see just in meetings when people talking about, hey, you know, we went through all this platform, we got out of it, we divested this. It's not really, you know, building blocks is a prime example for chemistry. A lot of building blocks used to be protected under extremely tight IP provisions. And now you see them starting to be shared. And hey, listen, if you come up with something great, this is preclinical science. We're really good at developing it. We've, you know, have the ability to manufacture them. Um, and we can provide them to you to try to develop your own wet science uh, technology. Great. So I think that that is starting to change to a limit. I mean, we all can't just go through and give everything away. Um, but at the same time, I think it's getting better when people are looking inside and say, what's the risk? Can we evaluate this risk you know, benefit if it's for society? I mean, vaccine development is a perfect example you know, for how we got for the testing kits for vaccine development. What do you have? I mean, I know for a fact some of our viral vectors were used and it wasn't, oh, we're charging you for it. And let's, let's use them. If you can figure out a better technology to develop using one of our vectors to help 
you know, basically a pandemic of the last, what, 150 years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's do it. I mean, we're not going to sit there and say, oh, no, this is ours. We want to make sure. And we didn't. And no company did, really. No, it was an amazing time. It really was. The spirit of collaboration uh, during COVID was incredible. So, Shahila, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions from a VC firm perspective. Particularly, my first one is, how do VC firms assess the potential of industry university partnership as investment opportunities? Yeah. So, VC firms uh, evaluate industry university partnerships through a multifaceted lens, which includes assessing not only that particular technology's potential, but also the capabilities of the university's own tech transfer offices. So we look at how how well do these tech transfer offices know their faculty, like who is doing what, have they really engaged with their faculty, and are, are they educating them on uh, talking about IP, the importance of protecting IP, Also, we look at how are they engaging with licensing negotiations? Are they rigid? Are they flexible? Do they really keep in mind the interests of all the parties involved? And um, also look at how well do they uh, support these entrepreneurial faculty? Do they really give them uh, support in terms of access to connections? Tell them about all the non-dilutive funding opportunities available for really getting a startup up and going. So uh, overall, for um, a well-functioning tech transfer office with a proactive approach uh, towards faculty engagement with efficient licensing practices and a strong grasp of uh, what are the funding opportunities out there that can support these startups that are uh, getting spun out through their offices really significantly enhances the uh, value proposition of the industry university partnerships, especially for a VC firm. And How can VC firms like yours also help to identify and overcome barriers to commercialization that come out of these university developed technologies? Yeah, so VC firms, uh, we play a vital role in bridging that gap between university developed technologies and their successful commercializations. So uh, we offer several key advantages, which includes our in-depth knowledge of the market landscape, and our knowledge about the specific industry priorities, which helps us identify those university technologies that have uh, a high commercial potential that can align with uh, a pharma's current needs. And uh, we also uh, work closely with uh, these startups to provide them with the much needed mentorship and business support services to help them really build compelling investment pitches and also help them access critical resources, which includes the nationwide uh, VC networks. And uh, recently we uh, started offering a new service called uh, Powered by Portal, which includes a portal really working closely with the university to help them design and construct their incubator spaces and also help them manage these incubator operations. And th- this gets us close to uh, you know, the startups that are emerging through the universities. And it also helps uh, build that much needed collaborative environment to foster that community where everyone is working towards the same goals on sharing knowledge and uh, you know, getting together collectively to uh, solve problems. So uh, by kind of leveraging our uh, market knowledge with our targeted support systems and uh, you know, critical infrastructure resources, we can significantly increase the success rate of uh, university-based startups uh, reaching uh, co- the commercial space. Just a follow-up question on the Powered by Portal. How many different uh, states have you been able to use that program in? So we just got started. So we just, as of this week, signed our first university. So that's going to be announced pretty soon. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. That's really exciting. Can you give us a scoop of which one it is, or at least the state, or is that confidential (laughs) information? Uh, It's going to be announced soon, and it's uh, in Illinois. Yeah. Oh, it's in Illinois. Okay. 
well, at least I got something. So, <laughs> <laughs> so John, I wanted to turn and ask you, what are some of the key considerations for pharma companies in evaluating potential industry university partnerships for drug discovery and development? I think it's alignment. I think it's alignment to what they're good at, what they want to do. I mean, you can take a horse to water, you can't make them drink. Um, so the forced fit and round peg square hole doesn't work. So they have to want to do it. They have to be excited to do it. Um, there is a resistance. You know, I don't want to say it's an age group, but we find it. People just don't want to work with pharma. Um, and, you know, you we really need to talk to a university that has researchers that are filling the gaps, what they're good at, what we're good at. Are we aligned that want to work together? If you have two consenting adults, I can get an agreement across the line and we can make this work. Um, if there's resistance on either side, let's get that out there, discuss it. Can it be, can we get past it? Yes, no. Um, that I think is, has the most synergistic effect is if we're aligned, we have research, we're good collaborators, we're the partner of choice for them. We listen to them, they listen to us and we're in agreement. I think nothing but success can happen. And I think where we have issue is I do a lot of work in oncology. And obviously, everyone wants to work with the best research in which I understand. We want to test our asset in the best model we can. I understand that. Sometimes that is very difficult. And I think it's very difficult for one, you know, we all know CAR-T, where CAR-T was and where it was and where it blossomed, what companies were involved. And it, you sort of, if you weren't in on the very ground floor, it's very hard to work in the area. Now, that resistance could become IP risk, that could become researcher sensitivity to not want to work with another. And that's okay. That happens. But I think if you have that conversation very early on to say, we have an idea, we looked at your research technology, your research focus within your you know, college of medicine or college of immunology, whatever it would be, it aligns very closely to what we would like to do. We would like to work with you. And again, you're talking about a face-to-face -face conversation to say, this is what we would like to do. What do you think? Um, this is not a quick you know, five-minute conversation. It's really diving into what researchers they have. Are you interested in doing it? Some institutions are very hungry to work with us. We want to be that partner. We want people to want to work with us, but I can't make you want to do it. So I think we sort of have a little bit of an EQ test. You know, you go talk to them, the technology's there, the science is there, everything's great. We have our expertise, we're bringing to their expertise. It should be wonderful, but at the end of the day, if they don't want to work with you, it's not going to work. And I think that that's something that, you know, sort of the, the social aspect and being the partner of choice is a very tough construct. But I mean, sometimes it has to be the soft skills that get you across the line. We, we want to work together. This is where we can be for the best success. And, you know, I know you're well aware of this, John, that there are definitely some new challenges and regulatory requirements in the pharmaceutical industry. So how can pharma companies and universities work to address some of these challenges? So I think the regulatory question, unfortunately, is more of a you know yes or no, <laughs> a yeah. binary answer. It's yes or no. And I think one of the challenges and what we're looking at now is we do a lot of work preclinical, pre-competitive style development science. And one of the questions we always get, well, how do you relate that to a regulatory filing for the GXP, GCP space? Uh, we don't. I mean, you know, we, we do everything we can to make sure that data can come across. And generally, in our academic collaboration, some of the academic centers, if they have a medical school, if they're running clinical trials, obviously they understand that. Some of the data protection and data security, data integrity steps that we have in the regulatory environment are so specific, we can't get there. I mean, there's no way uh, an industry partner or a company can ask an academic center, hey, can you develop a GLP lab and get that across the line? Oh, by the way, you need to do ALAC certification twice a year to make sure you're certified. It's just not realistic and it's not feasible because if for some reason that partner pivoted and went away from that, they would have spent all that money and not have the capability or need the capability there. So I think that's where it comes back to what are we good at? What can we do? Ty Gayatri's point earlier about the preclinical development space. So, you know, one of the things we get asked a lot is, well, how does the best way to approach us? I want one page. You're stuck with me in an elevator for five minutes. Tell me what you want to do, what area you want to work in and how we can do it. And I think if you know your capabilities, we know our capabilities, and we can say we're really good at this, but you're really good at that. And preclinical tech and preclinical development is a huge space where we're really good at that. We can do that. We don't expect universities to step up. So I think that the regulatory question is, fortunately or unfortunately, very clear. Generally, the larger partner that is looking at a filing or looking at the regulatory needs to make sure the data is appropriate. 
the university just needs to do the best they can. And I, I think that's reality. I don't think that you're going to ask. I'm not going to go to a university and say, you have to develop this or you can never work with us. I mean, that's just a, a caveat we're always going to have to uh, to fix. So this has been a really great conversation today, but the podcast is coming to a close. And as we get there, I wanted to ask the three of you to each pull out your crystal ball and share with us what you think the future holds for industry university partnerships. I can take it. Uh, the way, again, coming back whole, full circle to holistic approach, right? Um, again, now I'm going to uh, focus on the holistic a little bit differently. Um, I feel like for challenging big questions, um, societal problems, I think the way to go about it is through these kinds of large partnerships and collaborations. And that's where the holistic approach comes in. I think about four legs in a stool that makes um, things move, a challenge is solved. And, and the four legs are one is government um, support. The other is university research and innovation. Then you have industry collaboration and support and funding um, as appropriate. And lastly, the market. And the market could be all anything. It could be consumers. It could be um, anything specific to that particular uh, need or assessment. But I feel all these four legs have to be equally strong and equal length for the stool to not be wobbly or the table to not be wobbly. It has to work together in um, sync uh, to child, you know, solve real world problems. Yeah. Uh, well, science, as you know, just to add to that, science nowadays is moving really quickly and entering a transformative era. And this is more so because of the advancements in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning tools that have really accelerated the process with timelines uh, in the preclinical space, reducing to sometimes days um, as compared to years it took before. So this this rapid innovation is driving increased interest from pharma to start looking more at early stage technologies. And so I think uh, the university industry partnerships now is entering a new phase. And uh, it's important for universities to embrace this collaborative approach to really risk, uh, to not risk falling behind in this mm -hmm. race for scientific advancement. So I think now is the right time to foster strategic partnerships with external entities to kind of propel innovation forward and really capitalize on this immense potential of um, the upcoming new technologies. Well, yeah, the, only thing I, the only thing I can add to that is that we, I think we truly are at an inflection point that we look at how we're doing our stuff. How do we figure this out? Um, I can promise you that academic industry, VC, if we all work together, it'll be an exponential increase in our abilities. I mean, the the, the science that is out there in AI ML space to uh, Shahila's point is growing as fast as you can imagine. I mean, you're talking about three-dimensional slides. I mean, stuff that I would never imagined when I was in grad school. Um, so I think we all need to come to the table with a very open mind and say, what can we do? How can we do it? And what risk are we willing to take? And I think the company that leverages the risk, the science, if you can get other money, great. I mean, budget always comes down to it. It does. I don't care what we do. But I think if we're more open about how we can approach it, I think all we're going to do is bring medis better medicines to patients or better tech to patients faster. And mm -hmm. I, I do think that that's something that is really going to be a structural change in this environment, maybe not in clinical as much. So I understand when you get into phase one, phase two, phase three, and you're developing a drug and moving through the AI ML pieces, yes, but de-risking preclinical development in that way and really being able to focus on what is there and what we think is successful across three tiers to Gayatri's point, we all work together to say, hey, listen, this will be a phenomenal foundation. And if it's not, we pivot and we move on, but we're constantly learning and being malleable to that. I think it, there's a huge potential in the next you know, five to 10 years that we really could see a structural change on how we do preclinical development. Well, thank you so much, Gayatri, Shahila, and John. This has been an amazing discussion today. I really appreciate your time and all your expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have thank a wonderful you, day, Lisa. And that's a wrap for today's podcast. Thank you so much, Gayatri, Shahila, and John, for sharing your insights and experiences on industry-university partnerships. Thank you all again for being here, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. 
Thanks for listening to Autumn on the Air with Lisa Mueller. Get social with us and share your thoughts. You can tweet us at AUTM or visit us online at AUTM.net. We'll be back next week on the air. Be sure to join us.